Hi, welcome to the DRH show where I have wide ranging conversations with fascinating people. We talk about all things psychology, mental health and wellness. The lockdown and COVID-19, which is still going on, has transformed our lives and the way we do things. So it's more important than ever to talk about how we can manage our mental health as a result of this pandemic. So joining me today to flesh out these issues are psychologists who come from different specializations. We'll also talk about the recent book that we wrote on this topic, The COVID-19 Pandemic, a multidisciplinary approach to managing mental health challenges, which is published by the University of Malaysia Sabah. So in alphabetical order, Dr. Amonita Beckstein, he's a, he, is a counseling psychologist from Webster University in Thailand. Also joining me today is Dr. Paul Hutchings. He's an associate professor uh, of psychology at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. And finally, uh, I'm also join joined today by Dr. Harry Shah. Um, he's a senior lecturer at the University of Malaya in Malaysia. Um, good to see you all here and thanks for joining me. Now, um, at, at the risk of sounding impertinent, I hope I can just um, address you with your first name just to make things easy. Um, would that be fine? Yeah, that's fine with me. Absolutely, Absolutely fine. Okay, so Amanita, Paul and Harris, as I've mentioned earlier, you all come from different specializations. So this really makes um, it exciting for a more nuanced conversation about mental health and COVID-19. So let's kick this off with you giving us a snapshot of your research area. Um, let's hear it first from um, Amanita. Yeah, uh, I am mostly interested in multicultural counseling, multicultural psychology, uh, helping kind of boost and, and uh, increase happiness among ethnic minorities and underprivileged individuals. And then uh, I have most recently gotten really into the mental health uh, effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's kind of been my greater focus in the last year or so here. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Amanita. Th that's an exciting um, 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 background, Amanita, and hopefully we could kind of link your background into, you know, um, talking about mental health in relation to the pandemic. Now, um, let's hear it from Paul. Um, I understand um, you're also doing a bit of research in social psychology and also political psychology. Please ter tell us more about your um, current research um, project. I'm far more of a, a social and political psychologist, so I tend to focus a lot upon uh, issues to do with prejudice and discrimination in particular. So um, looking at how people view immigrants, how they view uh, issues of nationalism, both uh, at a you know at a UK level, but also um, increasingly looking at things worldwide. And so one of the things that uh, really interested us during the um, COVID pandemic has been this idea of what we call pathogen threat. So this idea that um, you know, members of an out group could be bringing a, a pathogen, a virus into the in group and the effect that that has on the way that people view those out group members. And so that's the, the sort of broad area where we started exploring things to, uh, related to COVID really. Fascinating. And finally, Harris, um, please tell us about what you're currently working on. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, I'm uh, based at the Department of Education, Psychology and Counseling, and uh, I'm supervising uh, a number of uh, PhD and master students. And a lot of the research uh, is about the applications of psychology in the educational context. But my personal uh, interest and my uh, main projects right now uh, are developing an instrument or a set of inventory uh, about uh, uh, employment uh, readiness or future readiness as we call it so this uh, for this instrument we're looking at uh, psychological pre-capital and also soft skill among the students uh, a second uh, project that I'm working on is actually on uh, students uh, burnt out um, focusing on undergraduate uh, students and uh, I've just uh, started working on another uh, similar project uh, we're going to look at burnt out uh, among employees and how that might uh, be uh, used to make an argument about um, the role of employers, how employers uh, should be held accountable or should be held responsible for the employee's mental health. Mm. That's and it, Dennis. 
Thank you. And of course, Harris, your, your background really, um, um, really is important in relation to, you know, mental health, because um, clearly um, the, the pandemic has changed the way we approach work. And of course, um, our productivity has been affected by the pandemic. Now, we'll delve, delve into that later. But as what I've said earlier, um, one of the key um, key goals of this um, interview is to kind of showcase to you um, the, the book chapters, the, um, the book that we've actually written. And um, my co-authors, Paul and, and Amanita, will actually um, talk more about this. Um, um, Amanita and Paul, if you could just share to us about the respective chapters that you've authored. Um, I suppose we'll start first with Paul. Um, tell us more about the, the chapters that you've written and what's kind of the, the, the impetus that um, made you decide to contribute on this book. Yes, yeah, so uh, my chapter was written with um, Katie Sullivan, who was uh, the co-author of it, and she was my PhD student. She was awarded her PhD a couple of weeks ago. So um, we were writing very much from the point of view of prejudice and discrimination initially as we started writing the chapter. But as we started to, to develop it, and we were exploring this area of how some students, uh, international students in particular, have found themselves being uh, discriminated against because of their nationality. So for instance, um, not just Chinese students, but many Asian students who um, you know, may not have even been anywhere near China, but may, may for instance, particularly in America, have found themselves as being you know, born as US citizens, have um, you know, grown up in America, but nonetheless, just because of the way that they looked, were being almost blamed for bringing this virus into their community. And so um, we were exploring things from that point of view. But then as we were looking at the news, we realized that all of the discussion about students very much focused on almost their studies and nothing else. And so you saw students being talked about purely in terms of their ability to study. But of course, students are members of our society as well. And many of them had suffered. Many of them had lost their jobs, for instance, particularly for many students, certainly in the UK, but I'd imagine also globally. They work in industries such as in uh, restaurants, in um, bars, in, in many of the places that were affected by the pandemic, and they lost their income. For some of them, this would have been devastating you know, in, in terms of being able to support themselves, but also if they were in a situation where they were having to support family members or where other family members had become ill or had lost their jobs, it was disrupting not just their studies, but their entire lives. And so we wanted to focus upon the different issues that students faced, not necessarily within their studies, because that's been covered in another chapter by one of the other authors, but we wanted to look at this intersection of students' lives and how they were impacted by many different things uh, to do with both their, their studies, but also how it impacted upon their mental health and the, the stresses in their lives. And also then things like digital poverty, the inability for some people to access you know, this move to online, for instance, and of course, this loss of earnings and the impact that that had. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. And, and of course, um, Amanita, you've also contributed with um, um, on this project. And your, your book chapter actually kind of overlaps with what Paul has written, because you've mentioned earlier that you also work with international students. But pl please tell us more about um, your, your, your chapter. And of course, you, you're the editor of this. I have to thank you for doing such a, a magnificent job of trying to, you know, c kind of make a writing more comprehensive. Absolutely, yeah. So, so we're we're talking about our book called a COVID uh, COVID nineteen a multidisciplinary approach to managing mental health challenges. And so, my chapter is on counseling and how counseling can contribute to lessening the impact of the COVID nineteen pandemic and in light of this pandemic, how we can reduce. So, not only is there a, a, a meant, uh, sorry, a physical health pandemic, there are also researchers are saying that there is a mental health pandemic, and they call this the kind of the second wave pandemic. And interestingly, that mental health pandemic is likely to last long beyond when the actual virus may disappear, let's say. So, you know, when we look at previous research on things like SARS, 
we had some folks that actually continued to demonstrate adverse mental health affects when they were followed up with 12, 15 years later. So we know that this may have long-term effects. And so what my chapter is, is talking about how we can reduce that through means of counseling. And so it, I, I overview uh, telepsychology counseling. So providing services over the phone, over the computer, uh, over text-based and even virtual uh, therapy and, and, and those types of things. I talk about competence. How can counselors and other mental health professionals gain that competence if they don't already have it so that they can provide ethical services. I talk about the multicultural implications, right? So there are certain things uh, uh, that certain cultures may uh, not have access uh, and or uh, much, much like Paul mentioned, right? The, all these populations that don't have access to more, uh, a high speed internet to be able to access these types of services. So uh, I bring in what, what a lot of the, the researchers and, and uh, other folks talk about uh, in terms of, of uh, how counseling can, uh, can again help. And I use a, a case scenario throughout the chapter to make it very accessible and easy to, to understand. A very realistic case scenario based on kind of a, a, a conglomeration of, of different cases. And uh, try to make it, uh, again, accessible for the regular uh, reader to, to read, but also to give some specific tips for mental health professionals to be able to uh, do their job kind of better during this time and, and then also some resources in order to continue to learn more. So that's a, a, a general uh, sum, I guess, of, of my chapter. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I, 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 mean, I like that you um, emphasize that this book is actually not just meant for academics or for someone with it, working within the, the counseling um, area, but it's also something that a lot, a lot of people could relate to because you know, um, 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 after all, we've all experienced the pandemic and we've all have mental health. Now, just because we're in the topic of, you know, how, how university students have been coping. Of course, this book is not just um, predominantly about um, university students, but, you know, uh, as we can see, you're all working in the academia. But just 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 to um, carry on the conversation. Um, 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 Harry, since you're based in Malaysia, could you just give us a sort of an overview how um, university students in Mal Malaysia are coping um, in, in relation to sort of, you know, the, the societal um, implications? Okay. okay. Uh, uh, when we talk about the university students in Malaysia, I, I think it would be uh, a point to make uh, that or it is a point that we cannot run away from to compare with the uh, primary school and secondary school students. And why is this important? Uh, it's because the government, uh, for some reason, uh, at some point has allowed the primary school students and the secondary, uh, secondary school students to go back to school. Uh, but the university students are asked to stay at home and continue their studies uh, from home. Uh, and I think this could have uh, make a difference to the experiences uh, uh, for them. And uh, in general, perhaps the, the, the level of uh, coping is quite uh, okay. But uh, we have seen uh, cases at the national level as reported in the popular media uh, that uh, some students are uh, negatively being affected by the pandemic. Uh, there were cases uh, recently where two students were uh, were, uh, were found dead, uh, and uh, the attribution for the death is uh, stress uh, due to the uh, studies. And uh, I think it has been mentioned uh, just now about the digital poverty, and uh, we still have students uh, lacking access to the internet, to the basic uh, devices uh, to uh, continue with their uh, studies, and. Um, of course, uh, in my uh, personal uh, experience, there are students who are uh, not coping well with learning from home. I think they are really missing the face-to-face -face communication, the face-to-face -face interactions with their uh, friends and also with their uh, uh, lecturers. Um, for example, there, there is a cohort of master's students, for example, 
they are now uh, uh, done with their first year and they haven't set foot at the university campus at all. So uh, they are not experiencing studies as they expected it to be. Uh, and bear in mind, these are people who decided to go back to the university after maybe uh, uh, doing uh, uh, different types of uh, jobs, perhaps after their bachelor degree, and now they are doing masters, but they are not getting the experience that they uh, expect. So um, I, I think for uh, these people, when the expectations are not met, uh, I think they are uh, not doing so well compared to other uh, students. Absolutely. And of course, Harris, um, this um, evidence that you're sharing to us, uh, how Malaysian students are coping, this is, these are actually shared um, experience. You know, everyone in, in the rest of the world can actually relate to that. So I, I suppose my follow up question to all of you, given that you're all psychologists and you're sort of um, involved within the mental health landscape, um, can you give us some tips on how we can manage the detrimental effects of lockdown in, in relation to your, you know, um, your, your um, expertise. Um, let's start first with um, Paul. Can, can you give us, um, from, from a social psychology standpoint, um, what would you say is the sort of best way to, to manage the detrimental effects of, of lockdown or, uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic? It, it is a very difficult one because, of course, you know, um, in, with individual differences, so many people have these different ways of dealing with things and of course many people have um different access and and different things in their lives and so there's certainly and i would i would imagine we'll probably all agree on this there's certainly no one size fits all criteria but i think that one of the main things is we we know through both social psychology but particularly through health psychology that there are models such as the self-regulation model and uh, these different types of module models where we need to um, you know, consider the the things that that we do have for instance and the our coping strategies are extremely important and so it's about some somehow remembering that you know that there is this external thing which is happening to us that it's not you know it's not our fault what is happening to us and so that's an important part for being able to to deal with a lot of this in order to um you know, to to try and remain positive i mean you <laughs> know in, in a way I'm, I'm talking about positivity and the natural thing here is to hand over to amanita certainly for this because this is his area you know far more far more than it is mine but i think you know that that certainly is some is something that uh that I'm seeing and hoping for from my my students and the people around me, certainly. Yeah, well, thank you for, for, for the nice segue to, to Amonita. So uh, Amonita, from, from a counseling standpoint, um, what would you say is the best, or shall we say, I think for lack of a better word, shall we say, um, that, that the optimal way of managing a mental health from a counseling perspective? Yeah, really, really good question. Thanks there. And so first off, we know that lockdowns kind of quarantine should be as short as possible. We, we have a substantial re research behind that saying we should make them as short as possible to reduce the adverse effects because the adverse effects are multiple, right? We're social creatures. We need to have kind of face-to-face -face contact with people. We need to be part of a community. We want to be uh, included and, uh, and kind of have that feeling of a village effect. And uh, we also kind of long and strive and, and need physical touch. And so these types of things are not always available in, in, in lockdown. And so trying to get those types of things met during that time uh, is, is important. Also, things like like nature is important for our physical health and, and mental health uh, uh, fresh air of course sunshine all of these things can not only help boost our immune system but boost our our uh, uh, mental health and so if we can somehow get those even in small doses uh, you know if, if, if you're not allowed outside like some people now uh, that are coming into Thailand right now are spending time in actual quarantine meaning they're locked in the room right so uh, for, for 14 days so if they can go to the window to get the the uh, the uh, you know a little bit of sun or natural uh, daylight those zeitgebers to help regulate the sleep and and those things uh, 
Yeah, uh, we, we, the, 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 there's there's a quite a bit uh, that that's that that is needed. You you all kind of alluded to uh, positive psychology, right? And so, absolutely, positive psychology can help looking at things like like hope, uh, reframing, right? If if we use terms like when the pandemic ends instead of if the pandemic ends, right? That kind of giving some some hope that there's going to be an end to this. It kind of shifts some some of our mindset. Uh, we we would want to. Uh, talk about healthy coping. So there, there's research out there that talks about using more active coping tends to have less of an impact, meaning that you actually face what's happening, you discuss it, you talk about it, those those types of things where, where you're actually actively coping with the problem rather than avoiding it, right, through drugs, alcohol, zoning out on Netflix and those types of things and not actually thinking of it. Of course, you might need those breaks sometimes, right, as long as it's not becoming a, a pattern that's that, that that that's taking you away and so there's some research also saying yes absolutely active coping is is better but if you're doing kind of multiple different types of coping sometimes maybe avoiding and then sometimes doing the the active then uh, that might be necessary in, in something like this that is considered a chronic long-term stressor that could also be considered a kind of a, a trauma also given the the fact that it's uh that, that it's traumatic for some people and again uh a long term uh uh one other thing would be uh the the access to uh, to people, right? Some people uh, are not getting that. Uh, so if they can do much like we're doing today, face-to-face, -face, even if it's video, that's uh, going to mimic the real life face-to-face -face that if you're not able to access people like that over kind of text-based communications, right? Uh, Harris here ha ha had had a cat on the screen earlier, right? So maybe you can't get the, the the physical touch with a with a human being. Maybe you can have a pet, or people can actually give themselves a, a kind of a, a hug, right? To 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 stimulate that that uh, that physical touch. So there is a quite a bit of things that that we can do uh, during during quarantine uh, and lockdown situations, if uh, if necessary. Again, the the, the uh, important thing would be to try to get these kind of natural uh, social and uh, and uh, kind of nature types of uh, needs met as as much as possible given the the circumstances. Absolutely, Thanks. and thank you for for mentioning about those um um, um aspects about positive psychology such as hope and coping and, and of course we also have to mention resilience um as, as someone whose background um lies within positive psychology those things that you've mentioned amanita really um strongly resonates with me now let's move on with harris because because harris um i understand that your your re research expertise lies within um organizational psychology and you've also done a bit of research about productivity so um as a psychologist working within that area what would you say is that because you know, with, with the lockdown, um, the, the boundary between personal um, space and, and workspace as, you know, kind of overlap. Um, say, for instance, um, I, I myself, I'll cite myself as an example. Um, I'm a student and I also have a full time job. And all, all along through the lockdown, I've just been stuck here at home. And of, co of course, that experience is not unique. A lot of people kind of, you know, Try, trying to um, find what, what where's the demarcation line between personal space and workspace. Um, what, what's your take on that, Harris? Okay. Um, I, I think one of the first things that I would uh, say about this is how ready are we to work uh, from home? Uh, and actually, uh, Amonira, you mentioned the cat. The cat has returned. <laughs> uh, well, how ready are we? And this is actually a good example. Uh, uh, of the home space uh, and the workspace uh, sort of uh, collide. Yeah? Uh, and uh, I, I gave a webinar, uh, I, I think last year, uh, th there was a request about uh, how can we set up a work, uh, workspace at home? And I think uh, many people are not ready and the employers are also not ready to, uh, to uh, facilitate the workers to work uh, from home. Uh, uh, and uh, we are, we are talking about the physical uh, uh, preparedness, uh, the, 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 the actual physical space to, uh, to work uh, in, and also the furniture, the, the, the lighting, the technologies, and so on. And uh, uh, I, in Malaysia, we have, uh, well, I think uh, 
almost everywhere now we have the home uh, uh, internet and uh, the home internet is uh, was subscribed by the household for home purposes but now it's also being used for work purposes so how does uh, employers actually uh, uh, assisting the uh, employees to use the uh, internet uh, to work from home and i think uh, uh, at the, so, uh, the in terms of the social preparedness as amadir mentioned earlier we were social creatures yeah uh, some work uh, can uh, perhaps uh, better be done in uh, isolation or in private uh, but there are people who still need to uh, communicate with other people uh, I, I think in even in uh, academia in universities there are uh, researchers who like to do their research in their own lab without interacting with other people and yet there are uh, researchers who really need to uh, meet other people, meet their research assistant, meet their PhD students and whatnot uh, to carry out uh, their work. Yeah, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, we cannot run away from uh, from uh, talking about other things that happen when we are working at home. Uh, uh, related to the previous question about the effect of lockdown and how we uh, well, can manage it, yeah, uh, we cannot really isolate the effect of working at home because the person working at home may also have a spouse or a partner who has been laid off. So they are dealing with the aftermath of being laid off. So it's not just purely lockdown issue. Or, uh, of course, now uh, more than ever, uh, people uh, have uh, someone that they love, someone that they know, someone that are close to them being affected by uh, the uh, disease. So they are also dealing with the uh, illnesses, uh, either personally or vicariously or perhaps they are also grieving over the loss of uh, uh, the loved ones. So the, uh, when we talk about uh, working from home, it's not um, an easy task uh, to do. And uh, of course, there are some people who flourish in this time. They are able to be more productive than ever. And uh, some people can even show to their employers that, hey, I can actually be more productive at home. So uh, can you just let me be at home? Uh, but then some of the employers are unwilling to entertain such uh, questions to the point that they are uh, uh, thinking of uh, resigning because they know they can do the job better uh, at home. So there are a lot of issues, uh, the physical issues, the uh, social issues, and of course the psychological issues that has to be uh, considered when we talk about uh, how the uh, lockdown, how the uh, pandemic is affecting the productivity when working at home. Absolutely. And, and I have to point out something really positive came out of, of this working from home. And I, I, I don't know if, if this is true for, for um, um, other people, but it's certainly um, true for me. Um, during the lockdown, I had more time to you know talk with my neighbours because obviously I'm home, they're also from home. And because um, um, I think around January of last year, there was something about from the NHS, like club for the NHS. And obviously that's kind of like, you know, um, um, build a sense of community that, you know, we're, we're all in this together. And I think that's that's one thing that um, we have to be sort of, you know, lo looking at the positive aspect of, of the lockdown um, in, in relation to our mental health. But thank you for, for highlighting those um, um, things to us, Harris. Um, but of course, aside from those, um, how it has impacted, how the lockdown in COVID-19 has impacted uh, mental health, and um, there's also another aspect of, of COVID-19 and lockdown that has brought in, into surface. Um, one of that is um, the, the transfer of communication, um, particularly um, conspiracy theory. And I was just wondering if, if Paul, given that his background is in social psychology, if you could you know, shed some light um, about um, the, the the conspiracy theory in, in relation to COVID nineteen, or is that something you know um, which is you know remote within uh, remote from your research area? But uh, um, share us your thoughts, Paul. Yeah, so not rem not remote. I mean, I, and I'll be the first to say that there there are some real experts on this, and so I, you know anybody who's interested in uh, the conspiracy theory side of things, not not just on COVID, but on many areas, um, you know, should probably go and read the work of. Um, Karen Douglas in particular and the research team at the University of Kent 
do some fantastic work on uh, conspiracy theories and have for many years. So I thoroughly recommend reading their work. But it is an area that we do have an interest in because, of course, your know, conspiracy theories, they do become particularly prevalent at these times of crisis. And um, they're also notoriously difficult to to deal with as well. There's There's an argument that... Uh, the the best way to deal with a conspiracy theory is through what we call inoculation, which is um, dealing with it before it actually occurs. And so making sure that you um, provide the correct information before the conspiracy theory starts. Once, once a conspiracy theory is out there, it's actually quite a difficult thing to deal with because, of course, it's very difficult to counter a conspiracy theory because... Uh, Anybody who tries to counter it can be accused of either being in the pay of those in the you know who are behind the conspiracy, or that you aren't informed enough, or that you don't have the information that they have, and so it's it's really difficult to change people's minds on conspiracy theories. And there's some really interesting research into um, why conspiracy th theories. You know, occur but also prevail so well and it does seem that um some people in particular have this um you know this uh this desire for for closure i suppose and and also um for understanding the world of course you know if you think about what's happened with covid the entire world has had havoc wreaked upon it by this virus that we have no control over and that could very easily happen again, for instance. And that's a really difficult thing for us to deal with as humans because we like to have order. We like to have a sense of control over our environment. And so by being able to explain it down to, um, you know, something which it, which is the machinations of, um, you know, some cabal which has secretly put together this virus or that it's been produced in certain ways, it's appealing at a at a ba quite a base psychological level. So I think that, you know, conspiracy theories are hard to deal with, but I think one of the ways to deal with them is to remain calm and uh, and logical and and factual you know the, there is it's, it's very tempting when faced with somebody believing in a conspiracy theory to throw your hands up in the air and um, you know have frustration that they may not see things your way but the best way to to deal with it is to discuss it factually as an individual you're probably not going to change that person's mind but if there is a, an accumulation of people of the same opinion, this may have an effect. I think another element which is also important to recognize is that not everybody who disagrees with you is a conspiracy theorist. So if we take something like the, um, the vaccination issues at the moment, where there are some people who do have what are fairly well-founded concerns if you think about the concern of whether a child and you know under the age of 10 for instance should be vaccinated there are concerns with regards to the costs and benefits and these are the things that you know are currently being discussed by many different scientists as they as they consider this safety issue and so somebody with a concern about whether they should vaccinate their child may have a very logical concern and shouldn't necessarily be thrown into the same pot as an anti-vax person who is arguing that the vaccination contains some secret uh, microchip that's been put there by Bill Gates, for instance. And so it's important for us to approach these things in a calm and logical manner and not just throw everybody into this, um, into this conspiracy theory pot if we disagree with them. Thank you. And th thank you for hi hi highlighting that, that not, not because, um, you know, s someone disagrees with you, it's automatically a conspiracy theory. But sometimes we also have to think that not, not because it's being discussed by mainstream media, it's automatically um, conspiracy theory is what you've said. And then there might be a reason about, say, for instance, the vaccine hesitancy, there might be a reason for that. I myself um, had and, and, and this is in no way that I'm saying that you should not get vaccinated. But if I could just share my personal experience, I have my own adverse reactions with with the vaccine. In fact, um, when I had my second dose, I was rushed to A&E because um, it was really that bad. But um, as, as you've mentioned, um, 
you, you know that that legitimate reasons why people would you know be hesitant about the vaccine. But but thank you for for covering us uh, for co covering those points, um, um, Paul. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to weigh in on the conspiracy theory topic. First, I'm really sorry to hear that you experienced such a s scary side effects, Dennis, and I'm grateful that you appear to be healthy and well now. So, Paul mentioned combating conspiracy theories with facts. The problem is, is that it's difficult to know what's factual these days. These can be confusing times for almost anyone. You know, we have to sift through a plethora of materials, including fake news and biased, unreliable news and info, that it makes it hard to know what to believe. Um, as Paul mentioned, we want to make sense of the world, and right now it's almost senseless what is happening to us. So it makes sense then that we would want to come up with explanations. We tend then to rely on heuristics, um, kind of mental shortcuts that are not usually reliable. Or we tend to rely on people we trust. You know, in the past year, I've seen some things that have been labeled as fake news or conspiracy theories being turned around 180 degrees when evidence is shown for the self-same. So, if there's evidence for a theory, it's no longer a conspiracy theory and then becomes an actual theory. We have not always known the facts or the information that we do know changes rapidly sometimes. Even some of the experts don't always agree with each other or even contradict themselves months later. You know, you need to wear a mask. You don't need to wear a mask. You need to wear a mask. So. I want to say, even if the wildest possible conspiracy theories are true, let's say that COVID is a farce and it's just a common flu, or on the other hand, none have any merit, any truth at all. From a mental health perspective, you know, we simply don't care. We are trained not to judge and to meet the person where they are. We support them to reduce their distress, which is what we're most concerned about. And most certainly, it is a fact that COVID-19 is causing distress and impaired functioning for many. Not all, of course. Some folks are flourishing the, during these times. So we would be equally concerned for the person who is so distressed to the point of functional impairment because of fear of contracting the virus as we would be for the other person who is experiencing the same impairment due to fear of uh, let's say 5G. Okay, thanks. Another thing that I, w I want to all uh, ask all of you, um, given that you're all um, psychologists um, based on different locations, um, Harris, for instance, is based in Malaysia, and Amanita is in Thailand, and Paul is in Wales. Um, uh, how could we sustain um, resilience among communities, given that this is not just sort of a personal um, challenge, but this is also imposed kind of um, global problems, community problems. So, so Harris, um, fr from someone who's based in Malaysia, could you sort of give us like um, a cultural context on how we could promote um, resilience within communities um, um, in relation to the effects of COVID-19? Okay, sure. Uh, I, I think that there is one uh, simple point that is easy to say, but it's, uh, difficult to implement perhaps, uh, which is to be aware of the resources available uh, to each member of the community. Uh, recently, um, th th there was this uh, white flag campaign uh, which was launched to help people who are running out of food and basic uh, necessities, uh, whereby they were encouraged to uh, held up uh, a white flag in front of their house so that uh, uh, assistance can be sent uh, immediately. But uh, the reactions by members of the community and uh, the political uh, leaders are quite surprising. And I, I think there is a, a legitimate reasons why people may not be able to acknowledge uh, a particular resource uh, or source of help that is available to them. Uh, for example, some of the reactions to this is uh, uh, has been analyzed uh, from a uh, uh, religious point of view. W what is the really what does religion say about asking for help publicly uh, as if you are giving up hope? Uh, 
uh, and also, also this issue has also been analyzed uh, from the political uh, uh, perspective. What does this say about the current uh, sitting government and what does it say about the uh, uh, the elected members of uh, parliament uh, serving uh, each, uh, uh, each uh, constituents? And uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, debate going on in the social media about what the white flag campaign means. Uh, but for me, I think it it show uh, being resilient, being able to uh, to to uh, recognize the resources available to you may not be a straightforward uh, thing. May not be a straightforward um, uh, recognition of uh, uh, the resources because there might be stigma associated with asking for help. Uh, there could be backlash. There could be uh, 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 prejudice. Um, because of your behavior asking for help. So I, I think to uh, uh, to create a sustainable resilience, I think we need to have more awareness about how to reduce the stigma, how to be more compassionate towards uh, others, and also uh, to uh, promote different uh, resources available to different members of the community. Because what one one of the example given uh, uh, as an uh, as a point in the debate about the white flag uh, campaign is uh, some of the middle class people are also uh, finding it uh, difficult to survive. They have big cars. They are living perhaps in a quite a sizable uh, house, but uh, their situation is uh, perhaps uh, not very good. So they have this uh, fear. If they are asking for help, then people will be uh, having negative uh, uh, thoughts uh, uh, about them. So uh, I, I think if we try to promote more compassionate uh, uh, attitude and also uh, try to deal with the stigma, I think that could uh, help us with uh, building uh, a sustainable resilience in the community. Absolutely. And I'd like to pick on what you said there, Harris, that it's really important to kind of, you know, get get in touch with, you know, other other communities, smaller communities within the community, like what you've said, that your religious community, um, whether you're religious or not, um, clearly um, it could also be a source of hope. It could also be a source of resilience. Now, um, Amanita, I understand that you're working with um, indigenous population, with um, international students. So uh, fr fr from that, um, vantage point can you tell us how we could um, sustain resilience resilience among international students yeah so uh, absolutely it's important to be able to build community among them support uh, among the, each other so that they have people to go to whether that is through an online or actually physically uh, connecting most certainly uh, international students face unique circumstances right so a lot of them are, are struggling with whether they go home or not some of them were kind of kicked out of their dormitories and had to find places to live uh, they're having to to be students of course and then also to face all, all the different uh, uh, social restrictions and and, and whatnot uh, happening in, in their lives so uh, but uh, not everybody is going to have adverse effects, right? Some uh, students can experience what we call kind of post-traumatic or peri-traumatic, peri being during the, the pandemic uh, growth, right? So they can actually experience kind of profound kind of personal growth. And so that's one of our goals is to facilitate this ongoing ability to bounce back. Resiliency isn't just uh, a bouncing back one time, but an ongoing reaction through time uh, and, and kind of how you look at your circumstances. And that can be strengthened and it can be taught. Right. We know that resiliency can be taught in practice. So uh, for, for every, anyone, including international students, we can uh, do do workshops. We can uh, whether that again is online or in person, we can teach about uh, specific kind of active coping strategies that I mentioned before, right? Problem solving, emotion focused coping, these types of things that can boost that uh, resilience. Doing things like teaching people to, to be in, feel in charge, understanding, accepting the situation, kind of facing uh, uh, the, the the situations. Those types of things can be can be useful, uh, you know. And 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 somewhat like uh, like Paul was mentioning, right? We want to be able to understand the world, and so when we don't understand what's happening, that can be quite uh, distressing. 
And so uh, sometimes just being able to do that, accepting the things that we can't change and changing the things that we can and, and kind of being able to kind of decipher out uh, what the difference is for those things. So those are some of the, 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 the ways that, that I could think of that, that might help uh, uh, international students, right? If, if, they, if they're able to have some control of, of their, their circumstances, gain that uh, social support, get their needs uh, met, trying to form uh, uh, helpful uh, habits, those could be kind of uh, protective for them. Uh, and so, uh, uh, yeah, and kind of normalizing the, cir the circumstances too, right? So I, I do for for example, uh, groups sometimes where, where we get together and discuss. And so that that's uh, another thing that's been recommended for international students, kind of getting together with other international students and realizing that they're they're going through a very similar type of, uh, of experience uh, that, that that others. Right. Uh, for example, lots of lots of uh, uh, international students in the States were told at, at one point that they all had to leave because they were studying online and, and visa stipulations said that they cannot stay in, in America if they're if they're online students and then uh, and, and and so that they were kind of pulled back and forth and then that was overturned uh, rather quickly but then uh, lots of lots of uh, students kind of went through that that uh, uh, distress of, of not knowing what to do and, and some of course had a, a left at that time so yeah uh, thanks for your question okay um, Harrison, Amonita, you really made um, important points about, you know, how we can sustain resilience through COVID-19. Now, um, Paul, um, is, is there any other things that we have not covered in, in relation to, you know, um, mental health and sustaining resilience that you might have covered within your book chapter? Yeah, so I, th I think that, uh, in, and it's been interesting to listen to, um, to Amonita and Harris talking about resilience there particularly almost almost at a community level and at a group level where in the in the UK and, and in America quite often resilience is often seen as this individual thing that that people have and that you almost have to stand on your own and and this idea of the of the community being part of that resilience I think is a really important thing that needs to come through in much of what we do over the next few months of the, of the pandemic and out of the other side and one of the things that we discussed in our in towards the end of our book chapter was the things that for instance universities and places of higher education need to be doing in order to support people because you know, resilience isn't just this individual thing it's a part of it but it's also about um, being able to access these resources around us as Harris was saying and um, you know, these institutions have a role to play as well. Institutions can't just rely upon the resilience of its students or of its workforce, for instance. There really has to be a coming together here of um, of those individuals and the institutions to find the best way through for people. And so, yeah, some of the, some of the recommendations that we have made have very much put emphasis upon in our case, talking about higher education, but you could also argue this from an organizational point of view of employers. There is, you know, it's really important for those organizations and institutions to support the people who work for them or who they are dealing with to be able to get through this as well. So the, the resilience is both individual but also group based as well. Thank you, Paul. And of course, as you can see, there are so many things that um, we, we need to take into account when we're talking about managing our mental health from a multidisciplinary perspective. Um, um, Harris and Amanita and Paul, they, they all made you know a clear case that it's really difficult to just you know kind of pinpoint how we can manage our mental health. So um, we, we tried our best to um, sort of um, comprehensively tackle this um, um, in a book. And if, if you want to learn more about the things that we have discussed here, I'll put the link to the book um, in the video description note. But uh, I, I suppose we'll end the discussion there, but um, I'll just give you um, a, a chance to tell us what else is in the pipeline. And of course, um, if people wanted to reach, um, to reach out to you, how can they get in touch with you? And um, we'll start first with um, Amanita. Yeah, uh, so j just uh, uh, briefly, uh, you know, w one thing we, we talk about the mental health professionals and, and those, but I also like to put out a call that this is 
a, a group effort. Everybody should be involved in, in doing this. Everybody should learn basic kind of caring, listening skills. And that can help both yourself, right? We know that when we are altruistic and listen and care for somebody else, as long as we're not in, in overly too much distress and crisis, then that can help ourselves and other people. And so, the, you know, this, this is a time when uh, it, people are actually more open to talking about mental health. It, it's becoming less stigmatized. And so this could be a time for kind of a massive shift in the way that we address mental health and get more and more people being on board and supporting each other and hopefully decreasing the need for the mental health professionals because we have more caring, understanding folks. Of course, if it becomes too dis distressing and overwhelming, then you would, then uh, uh, that th those people would want to be able to uh, uh, tra uh, transfer to refer to the mental health professionals in, in a nice handoff. But again, there, there's a lot that, that uh, our community can do without that. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I'd encourage uh, uh, that. Uh, and then uh, in terms of being able to uh, get, a, get a hold of me, uh, you could look at amanita.com. That takes you, me, you to my LinkedIn uh, or dr.amanita uh, on Instagram. That's amanita.com for uh, uh, LinkedIn or dr.amanita on Instagram. Thank you. Thank you. I'll also put that on the video description note. Um, Harris, um, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us um, um, about what we talk about? And also, how can we get in touch with you? Okay. Uh, to get in touch with me, you can uh, go to my Twitter account, uh, Dr. Uh, D R H A R R I S S H E H, all one word. Or you can find me on uh, Facebook. Uh, I use my real name, uh, uh, Haris Shah Abdul Hamid. So you can search me there. Uh, and I think in terms of uh, what we have talked uh, uh, so far uh, in this uh, show is, I think th there is hope uh, that uh, we will be able to get through. Uh, and uh, I, I think I, I was uh, uh, interested with uh, a point that uh, Amanita mentioned uh, before, and I think we can think about this uh, maybe in another four, five years, I don't know, uh, because some people has likened uh, the pandemic uh, to war. And our frontliners are our soldiers and our generals and uh, whatnot uh, fighting the war. Uh, so maybe in uh, a few years from now, we will be talking about the pandemic veterans, how we are going to help the pandemic uh, veterans, uh, because uh, we know uh, from what I mean, I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, uh, the effect of the pandemic may be over, but then the mental health issues may be taking a bit longer. So uh, that, that, that could be an idea that we can explore. Absolutely. And of course, there's a lot more work for psychologists and mental health professionals on how we could actually try to minimize the impacts of lockdown and, of course, the, the other impacts that we're still not aware of. Um, and finally, um, Paul, um, final thoughts and how can we get in touch with you? Yeah, so... <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the prejudice and discrimination um, field is, is seeing a lot to do with COVID, particularly as these barriers have been put up around countries from the virus. It's also put them up between people as well. And so we are seeing quite a lot related to prejudice and discrimination. And so we're doing a lot of research there. But it's also given us this opportunity and this book is a prime example but also some other research papers that we've been working on to work collaboratively right the way across the world to look at the similarities and the differences which are being faced by so many people across the world and i think that um, you know from the research that we've done many of the similarities are far greater than the differences when it comes to the the challenges that people are facing through this pandemic and so the opportunities that have been afforded to us to, you know, to, to do this collaborative work and to continue with with that as well, I think is going to be really important. And so, yes, people people can um, find me just if you go to the um, University of Wales Trinity St David uh, website and just search for me. So, if you search for Paul Hutchings, you'll find me in the psychology department. And you'll also find me on Twitter as Paul B. Hutchings. And yeah, if anyone wants to get in touch, I'd be happy to chat about anything with, with people. 
Thank you, Paul. And um, yes, um, uh, thank you for highlighting to us the importance of, of collaboration. And actually, I think that's one of the um, aims of these books to, to showcase, um, you know, how people from different different specializations could work together to, to present, you know, ways on how we could manage um, a mental health in, in relation to lockdown and COVID-19. Well, thank you for your time, um, Harris, Amonita and, and Paul. Um, it's been lovely chatting with you. And thank you for sharing to us your, your time and your expertise and also talking about the, the book chapter that you wrote um Amonita and Paul and Harris of course thank you for sharing to us um your 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 research area um but unfortunately um we ran out of time um but um so we'll just leave it there um th thank you and um I look forward to hearing more about your work <laughs>